Hello and welcome back to the Stat Dose podcast. So today we're going to be going through IV fluids. We'll talk a bit about basic fluid physiology, the assessment of fluid status, fluid resuscitation, fluid maintenance, and a little bit about paediatrics as well. So we're going to talk about some fluid physiology, just to, to kick us off. Everyone's favourite bit of science. So generally, about sixty to seventy percent of our of our body weight is water. So generally, in the, in the average adult, uh, that's going to be about forty to fifty liters um, of water. Now that's split into two large components: uh, intracellular or extracellular fluid. The majority of fluid is intracellular, so about sixty percent of that total. In terms of what your extracellular fluid can split into, that's going to be either your intravascular, your circulatory fluid, or your interstitial fluid. Now, as most of you are probably aware, we're really interested in the circulatory fluid, the intravascular fluid, because that's actually what's going to be perfusing our brain, perfusing our organs. So there we're talking about the plasma and the lymph. In the average adult, that's going to be about five litres. And those are the things that we're going to have most impact on when we're giving fluid bonuses. But I suppose the other thing we need to, to consider is actually what's our normal intake and output. Liz, do you want to talk us through that? Yeah, sure. So we want our intake and our output to equal one another. So we're looking at about 30 mils per kilogram or about 2.4 litres per day. As far as the intake goes, drinking water is about a litre to one and a half litres. That's going to make over up just over half of our intake. And then the rest of it comes from our food um, and a little bit of water from oxidation. Um, as far as our output goes, um, our urine output's about the same amount as what we drink, so about one to one and a half litres. And then we lose some through insensible losses, like through sweat or water vapour and um, through our stools as well. That's, that's an important point, isn't it? It's, it's yeah. the, the fluid that we lose through through sweat, particularly. If, yeah. you know, we're we're going to go and talk about assessment of, of fluid status later. But if you've got a, someone who's persistently pyrexial, then actually they're going to be losing a bit more fluid. If they're breathing quickly, they're going to be losing a bit more fluid as well. So that's a really important uh, category not to forget when we're thinking about our patients. So that's especially in like the septic patient mm. or a patient that's septic and someone that's post-surgery as well. Because if they've had um body cavity open for a while, you get far greater output of fluid through insensible losses then. So as um, Liz has said, for water or fluid, it's 30 mils per kilo per day is the normal requirement. For sodium, chloride and potassium, it's approximately um, one millimole per kilo per day. And glucose is between 50 to 100 grams per day. How would you go about assessing a patient's fluid balance? Taking their history, um, somebody who's really thirsty is mm-hmm. going to be more likely to be hypovolemic, don't they? Their comorbidities would be, so if they're in heart failure or renal failure perhaps, if they've got portal hypertension, ascites, those kind of things are going to affect their fluid balance. Mm-hmm. Yeah, those comorbidities are important, aren't they? Particularly when we're worried about hypervolemia. So yeah. those are patients that we're going to be naturally more cautious about giving significant volumes of fluid. And looking at their previous losses as well, if they've had diarrhoea or vomiting, they're going to be low on fluid, or if they've been ill by mouth for an extended period of time. Moving on to how we can assess patients clinically, but let's get some hands on. So I'm a big fan of actually, you know, COVID has changed how we sort of approach patients and we're used to socially distancing from people now, but actually it's really important when you're seeing patients just to get hands on. So actually let's feel their hands. Do they feel warm? Are they flushed? Are you suggesting they might be a bit over fluided? which is definitely a word. Or are they very cold? Are they clammy? Which might suggest that they're a little bit hypovolemic. Also, the checking the pulse when you're running around there, feeling the hands. Is it, does it feel like a good character radial pulse? Is it particularly weak? Is it very quick? Which might suggest that they're tachycardic from a hypovolemia. I think that's really important, that palpating that pulse, because mm. it tells you an awful lot about their overall condition. Mm. That experience only comes from feeling a lot of pulses. So yeah, obviously you can feel your own while you're, you know, while you're sat listening to the podcast. But understanding the range of normal is quite important as well. And actually feeling sick patients' pulses is, is quite important. And there's so much that you can get from feeling your pulse. The temptation to monitor a patient mm. just from the automatic blood pressure machine, yeah. pulse and everything. Mm. And you lose so much information by not putting your fingers on that mm. pulse. You can always tell an experienced nurse when they go, the blood pressure says this, but I don't believe it. And that's because it's, they're getting it from the other signs of actually the pulse looks okay. The, the patient themselves looks looks all right. The blood pressure, for, for whatever reason, is, is reading you know, 60 systolic. 
they got a good pulse. They look all right. The GC15, I don't think that blood pressure is accurate. That's mm. a really good, yeah. uh, really good experience nurse there. And when we're talking about blood pressure as well, the trend is obviously uh, important to see actually what is the blood pressure doing. It's going up and down. But also postural hypertension, I'm a big fan of. So it's a very sensitive indicator of some, of some hypovolemia, particularly in young people. Young people are very good at maintaining a blood pressure till mm. essentially the very end when it drops off. Compensating. Compensating, absolutely, till, till the very end. And if they've got a postural hypotension, that's a good indicator that they're hypovolemic. What other things can we can we look for on examination, guys? You can look at their um, skin, see how turgid it is. I, think oh, I love a good skin turgid. turgid. <laughs> <laughs> so um, if it's quite elastic and if when you pinch the skin it goes back to normal quickly, then they're probably hydrated. If not, they're dehydrated. Eyes, if they're sunken or puffy, and that goes as well with any other peripheral edema. And then you get your pulmonary edema yeah. as well, don't you? Mm. Yeah. yeah. That's another thing, JVP. Raise AVP suggesting hypervolemia um, or some sort of intrathoracic pathology. But uh, yeah, so in the context of a fluid assessment, yeah. we're worried about pulmonary edema and hypervolemia mm-hmm. there. And then you've got your normal observations, such as your blood pressure, whether it's high or low, heart rate, bradycardic or tachycardic, your capillary refill, and you have to check that centrally as well as peripherally. So when you're checking a central capillary refill, you need to push and hold onto the sternum for at least five seconds before releasing and then see how many seconds it takes for the colour to return to the skin. So when you're taking observations, do remember the trend is what you're looking at. An individual observation on its own, you can't base all your assessment on that. Urine output's difficult because if you've got an ambulatory patient that's going out to the toilet, it's really hard to measure it. You'll need to ask them to take a commode with them and sit in the commode in the toilet or hopefully in the bed space. And then the nursing staff can weigh it to measure how much output the patient's had. You can also catheterise a patient, but you do have to look at clinical need for that because there is an increased um, infection risk if you catheterise a patient. So the only other thing to mention is weighing patients. So a lot of the time we talk about water weight. So particularly uh, heart failure patients and dialysis patients or, or renal failure patients, we will often do daily weights and, and adjust either the furosemide or the, the amount of dialysis that they, they receive based on their weight. And it's a really good sort of non-biased indicator of, um, of their total body water. So you're also looking for trends in blood results as well, aren't you? For example, yeah. their renal function, whether it's been static or changed significantly since the last measure. The urea, what we're talking about using these, the urea is quite a good specific indicator for dehydration as well. So you often see, if you've got an isolated raised urea, that's just somebody who's dehydrated without any significant knock-on effects to renal function. So an isolated mm-hmm. urea rise is quite good. And the other thing that you often see is a uh, an increased hematocrit. So hematocrit yeah. is essentially a, a measure of how thick the blood is and how much plasma is in that, in that blood. So if you've got a raised hematocrit, again, that's another good indicator alongside urea that that patient's dehydrated. And albumin and total protein are quite useful as well, aren't they? Yeah, so albumin is helpful because it increases your blood oncotic pressure. So that's why the liver failure patients get edema everywhere because they don't have that oncotic pressure, that protein in their blood, drawing fluid in, preventing it from leaving the intravascular space. So yeah, checking it out, really important thing to do. So what types of fluids are there that we can give? There's quite a few, I think. There are, there's, there's loads of options and I think this is probably why students struggle in the area of IV fluids. It, it consistently it's something that the students always say that they don't, they don't feel confident and they don't, don't fully understand and it's because there's so many different variations in practice. There's no point going through all of them because you'll just get bombarded with information, but you do need to know a few. Normal saline is the fluid of choice, particularly for resuscitation. Normal is definitely the wrong word, so it's 0.9% saline. There's nothing normal about saline. It's a bag of water with some sodium and chlorine in it. But that's the normal dose that we give, which yeah. is why it's called normal saline. Yeah. The the other big uh, crystalloid is Hartman's. So Hartman's is uh, is marketed as being more physiologically stable because it, the electrolytes in it are similar to that of um, plasma. The evidence doesn't stack up, essentially. So there's no evidence of benefit for using Hartman's in resus. There is some benefit from not overusing 0.9% saline but that doesn't mean Hartman's is better. Um, and it's essentially a quite expensive fluid, which is often used as maintenance inappropriately, in my opinion. So is that because it's got a little bit of potassium in it that people tend to favour it? Yeah, so it's got a bit of potassium, it's got a bit of lactate in it, it's got a bit of um, calcium in it as well. Do you um, think that's why it's preferred in critical care, though, where patients lose potassium? My, my honest opinion is, is that it's preferred in critical care because 
uh, it's expensive and they like expensive things. If you want to replace somebody's potassium, you can put potassium in a saline bag mm -hmm. and that's a better way to replace potassium. There's only five millimoles of, of potassium in, in a bag of Hartman's, which mm -hmm. is not a lot at all. So you're not going to be replacing any potassium. Um, the one place that you won't see any Hartman's is the renal ward in the hospital because of that small amount of potassium. But realistically, it's quite a negligible amount. This is the issue I have with Hartman's particularly. If you go to a surgical ward and you've got a poor overworked F1 who's trying to prescribe maintenance fluids, that somebody at some point will have prescribed Hartman's. And because all the numbers in Hartman's are a little bit different, what's much easier to prescribe is a mix of saline and glucose because you know exactly, we talked about the start and we're talking about fluid physiology. You need the one millimole of potassium, one millimole of sodium, one millimole of chlorine a day, 50 grams to 100 grams of dextrose and about 2.5 litres. So if you prescribe in, in a 24-hour period a litre of 5% dextrose, you get your 50 grams of, of glucose. If you prescribe a litre of saline with 40 millimoles of potassium, you're going to get enough sodium, potassium and chlorine. And then you can add another 500 ml bag of glucose. The, the issue comes, as I say, when you add in Hartman's to that mixture and suddenly a lot of maths is required to work out how much sodium, potassium, chlorine, potassium, etc. You know, all those little things that have gone into that patient and suddenly it becomes very difficult to give that patient a sensible fluid regime. So that's why I'm quite anti-Hartman's, certainly outside of ICU theatres. If you're on the wards, keep it very simple. Keep it to what you know, which is the sodium chloride, it's your dextrose. A lot of the time we will see in practice um, saline and glucose. Uh, so it's normally 0.18% saline with 4% dextrose. Um, we often use that a lot in kids, and that's shown to, to reduce the risk of AKI and things in adults. So that would probably be one of the future fluids that we use. The issue at the moment is that most in-hospital pharmacies don't stock it. So we're still, in many ways, in a bit of an old-fashioned fluid regime. Let's say, for example, we've got an unwell patient. We've done our assessment that we've talked through. They've done a bit of an A to E. Mm -hmm. We noticed that they're, that they're shocked. Their blood pressure is less than 60 systolic. Their heart rate's around 120. Can we panic? We can panic. We can always panic. Fluid resuscitation, then. What, what are we going to need to give that patient her? So, fluid. <laughs> Thank you. What well, fluid? Some yeah. IV stats. Thank you. Stay in the obvious. If you've got a really sick patient in front of you and you need to do um, fluid resuscitation, if they're a normal, healthy weight adult with no major comorbidities, then it's a 500 milliliter bolus of crystalloid. So as Matt says, he likes um, normal saline, which is 0.9%. 500 mils, although an anaesthetist might put up 500 mils of Hartmann's. Yeah, but you guys, when you qualify, will not be anaesthetists. So as F1 and F2, uh, saline is your preferred resuscitation fluid. Because keeping it simple does keep it safe. If you've got someone with comorbidity, someone very frail or tiny, then a 250 milliliter bolus is appropriate. If they've bled and they've got a major hemorrhage, then you want to consider activating the major hemorrhage protocol. So what comes in that map? There's two packs. You've got pack A, which has got four units of, of blood, normally O negative blood, and uh, four units of FFP, which is fresh frozen plasma. It's got some clotting factors in. That's your, your initial pack. If you've got ongoing bleeding, uh, despite that first pack, then you get four more of blood, four more of FFP, and one unit of platelets. So when you're activating that, you need to make sure you take a cross match? Yeah, so ideally a uh, cross match before you start a transfusion. Always reassess. If you've treated a patient, then reassess to evaluate the outcome. It might be that they need more fluid. It might be that you need to phone for help and escalate care. It's always better to maintain fluid balance than to have to correct it. So oral and enteral fluids are always better than IV. IV fluids should only be introduced if patients can't meet their fluid needs orally or enterally. And they should be stopped as soon as they're able to meet their requirements in a normal way. Prescribing more than two and a half litres a day increases the risk of hyponatremia and never, ever, ever give potassium faster than 10 millimoles per hour to a patient on a ward. So because if you give too much potassium, you may cause the patient to go into a cardiac arrhythmia. Yeah, the key point there is on the wards. What's different about how they give potassium in, in ICU? So in ICU, it's given centrally because otherwise it would be toxic to one of the peripheral veins. And they've got a constant 3D ECG monitoring. And when we're, we're 
got our patients on regular IV fluid, Liz, and we're, yep. we're monitoring them. You're, let's say you're that F1 coming along and, and someone asked you to, to prescribe some more IV fluids. What sort of things are we going to look at that's going to help our decision making? Um, so first of all, I'm going to look at their fluid balance charts and just see what their input is versus their output. Um, I could look at their weights that they've done twice weekly, mm-hmm. if not daily, just see whether their weight's going up or down. Checking their uh, user knees daily initially. Um, and then that can decrease as they are less severely unwell. Mm. And then just, yeah, basically daily clinically reassessing the fluid status. So, so fluid balance in paediatrics is a bit different, isn't it, Matt? You need to be a bit more careful because you're looking after little people. Little people, yes. They're not little humans, they are children. Well, they are little humans, right? <laughs> but they're not little adults, that's <laughs> what I mean. <laughs> they're not... They're very different physiologically. Yeah, and that's, that's the, the go-to phrase from paediatrics. And their physiology is a little bit different and their anatomy is a little bit different. Their assessment things, though, are all the things we mentioned before. So we don't actually need to assess them in a, in a particular way. Sort of clinically, obviously, we need to be a bit nicer with toys and whatnot and keep the, the kids happy. But actually, all the stuff we talked about, particularly skin turga, cat refill, trends in observations are still really useful. We should be using them in, in paediatrics. Well, there's several real options when you're um, giving fluid to to a children uh, to a to a child to a children, to a children. <laughs> um, with with adults we're a bit more liberal and we'll happily just give a bit of fluid here a bit of fluid there but with with kids we generally either giving fluid in resuscitation or we're giving maintenance fluids or we sometimes give maintenance plus a third for example if they're just a little bit dehydrated. So a lot of the time we need to work out how dehydrated they are. Um, and there's loads of different uh, protocols. So check your local guidelines when, when you qualify. But we're generally looking for uh, less than 5% dehydration, less than 10% dehydration, or more than 10% dehydration. And so that's going to help us tailor our fluid uh, balance to them. But as, as most things in pediatrics are, everything's weight based. And there's loads of different ways to do the calculations. And it's probably best if you're doing a PEDS job to look it up at at the time rather than us explaining the weight calculations. If you're on the YouTube, we'll put some examples up and and how you you calculate the weight in in pictorial form. But otherwise, have a little look where you're you're working and work out what you need to to give. In paediatrics, the the fluid of choice is almost always saline dextrose, 0.9% saline with 5% dextrose. You sometimes will use 0.45% saline with dextrose if the patients are hyponatremic. And if you're having to give fluid boluses, if you're giving more than three fluid boluses, then you're likely to need some hydrotropic support. So make sure you get your intensive care colleagues involved early with those sick, septic children. So just to summarise then, um, we need to make sure that the intake is matching the fluid losses and we need to assess the fluid status fully um, using the history and examination, do all the observations and looking at your blood tests and then think, are you doing these fluids either for recess or for maintenance? Encourage your patients to drink early because prolonging the IV um, fluids gives them a slower recovery. And just a reminder, standard recess fluids are normal saline or Hartman's in 500 or 250 milliliters.